videos upstairs we'll see but today I want to come and do um, a, a story by Alice Walker called Everyday Use. I see that my story times are doing great. So I wanted to kind of keep them going. So every, Everyday Use by Alice Walker and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let me pull it up. I will wait for her in the yard that Maggie and I made so clean and wavy yesterday afternoon. A yard like this is more comfortable than most people know. It is not just a yard. It is like an extended living room. When the hard clay is swept clean of the floor and the fine sand around the edges, lined with tiny irregular grooves, anyone can come and sit and look up into the elm tree and wait for the breezes that never come inside the house. Maggie will be nervous until after her sister goes. She will stand hopelessly in corners, homely and ashamed of the burn, scars down her arms and legs, eyeing her sister with a mixture of envy and awe. She thinks her sister has held life in the palm of her one hand, that no is a word the world never learned to say to her. You've no doubt seen those TV shows where the child who has made it is confronted as a surprise by her own mother and father tottering in weakly from backstage. A pleasant surprise, of course. What would they do if parent and child came out and only a curse and insult each other? On TV, mother and child embrace and smile into each other. Sometimes the mother and father weep. The child wraps them in her arms and leans across the table to tell how she would not have made it without their help. I have seen these programs. Sometimes I dream a dream in which Dee and I are suddenly brought together on a TV program of this sort. Out of a dark and soft seated limousine I am ushered into a bright room filled with many people. There I meet a small smiling gray sporty man like Johnny Carson who shakes my hand and tells me what a fine girl I have. Then we are on stage and Dee is embracing me with tears in her eyes. She pins on my dress a large orchid even though she has told me once that she thinks orchids are tacky flowers. In real life I am a large big boned woman with rough man working hands. In the winter I wear flannel nightgowns to bed and overalls during the day. I can kill and clean a hog as mercilessly as any man. My fat keeps me hot in zero weather. I can work outside all day, breaking ice to get water for washing. I can eat pork liver cooked over the open fire minutes after it comes streaming from the hog. One winter I knocked a bull calf straight in the brain between the eyes with a sledgehammer and had the meat hung up to chill before nightfall. But of course, all of this does not show on television. I am the way my daughter would want me to be. A hundred pounds lighter. My skin like an uncooked barley pancake. My hair glistens in the hot bright lights. Johnny Carson has much to do to keep up with my quick and witty tongue. But that is a mistake. I know even before I wake up, whoever knew a Johnson with a quick tongue? Who can even imagine me looking a strange white man in the eye? It seems to me I have talked to them always with one foot raised in flight, with my head fumed in whichever way is farthest from them. D though, she would always look anyone in the eye. Hesitation was no part of her nature. How do I look, Mama? Maggie says, showing just enough of her thin body, enveloped in pink skirt and red blouse for me to know she's there, almost hidden by the door. Come out into the yard, I say. Have you ever seen a lame animal, perhaps a dog run over by some careless rich person who owns a car, sidle up to someone who is ignorant enough to be kind to him. 
That is the way my Maggie walks. She has been like this, chin on chest, eyes on ground, feet in shuffle, ever since the fire that burned the other house to the ground. Dee is lighter than Maggie, with nicer hair and a fuller figure. She's a woman now, though sometimes I forget. How long ago was it that the other house burned? 10? 12 years? Sometimes I can still hear the flames and feel Maggie's arms sticking to me, her hair smoking and her dress falling off her in little black papery flakes. Her eyes seem stretched open, blazed open by the flame reflected in them. And D. I see her standing off under the sweet gum tree she used to dig gum out of. A look of concentration on her face as she watched the last dingy gray board of the house fall in towards the red hot brick chimney. Why don't you do a dance around the ashes, I'd want to ask her. She had hated the house that much. I used to think she hated Maggie too, but that was before we raised the money. The church in me to send her to Augusta to school. She used to read to us without pity, forcing words, lies, other folks habits, whole lives upon us too, sitting trapped and ignorant beneath her voice. She washed us in a river of make-believe burned us with a lot of knowledge she did we didn't necessarily need to know. Pressed us to her with a serious way she read to shove us away like dimwits at that moment we seemed about to understand. D wanted nice things. A yellow organdy dress to wear to her graduation from high school. Black pumps to match a green suit she made from an old suit somebody gave me. She was determined to stare down any disaster in her efforts. Her eyelids would not flicker for minutes at a time. Often I thought off the temptation to shake her. At 16, she had a style of her own and knew what style was. I never had an education myself. After second grade, the school was closed down. Don't ask me why. In 1927, colored asked fewer questions than they do now. Sometimes Maggie reads to me. She stumbles along good-naturedly, but can't see well. She knows she is not bright, like good looks and money. Quickness passes her by. She'll marry John Thomas, who has mossy teeth and an earnest face. And then I'll be free to sit here and I guess just sing church songs to myself although I never was a good singer, never could carry a tune. I was always better at a man's job. I used to love to milk till I was hooked in the side in 49. Cows are soothing and slow and don't bother you unless you try to milk them the wrong way. I have deliberately turned my back on the house. It is three rooms just like the one that burned except the roof is tin. They don't make shingle roofs anymore. There are no real windows, just some holes cut in the sides like the portholes in a ship. But not round and not square with rawhide holding the shutters up on the outside. This house is in a pasture too, like the other one. No doubt when Dee sees it, she will want to tear it down. She wrote me once that no matter where we choose to live, she will manage to come see us, but she will never bring her friends. Maggie and I thought about this, and Maggie asked me, Mama, when did Dee ever have any friends? She had a few. Furtive boys in pink shirts hanging about on a wash day after school. Nervous girls who never laughed. Impressed with her, they worshipped the well-turned phrase, the cute shape, the scalding humor that erupted like bubbles in lie. She read to them. When she was courting Jimmy T, she didn't have much time to pay us, but turned all her fault-finding power on him. He flew to marry a cheap city girl from a family of ignorant, flashy people. She hardly had time to recompose herself. When she comes, I will meet. 
But there they are. Maggie attempts to make a dash for the house in her shuffling way, but I stay her with my hand. Come back here, I say. And she stops and tries to dig a well in the sand with her toe. It is hard to see them clearly through the strong sun, but even the first glimpse of leg out of the car tells me it is D. Her feet were always neat looking as if God himself has shaped them with a certain style. From the other side of the car comes a short, stocky man. Hair is all over his head, a foot long, and hanging from his chin like a kinky mule tail. I hear Maggie suck in her breath. Mmm, is what it sounds like. Like when you see the wiggling end of a snake just in front of your foot on the road. Mmm. D next. A dress down to the ground in this hot weather. A dress so loud it hurts my eyes. There are yellows and oranges enough to throw back the light of the sun. I feel my whole face warming from the heat waves it throws out. Earrings, gold too. And hanging down to her shoulders. Bracelets dangling and making noises when she moves her arm up to shake the folds of her dress out of her armpits. The dress is loose and flows, and she and as she walks closer, I like it. I hear Maggie go, mmm, again. It is her sister's hair. It stands straight up, like the wool on a sheet. It is black as night, and around the edges are two long ponytails that rope about like small lizards disappearing behind her ears. Wasu Zotino, she says. Coming on in in that gliding way the dress makes her move. The short stocky fellow with her with the hair to his navel is all grinning and he follows up with Asalaamu Alaikum my mother and sister. He moves to hug Maggie but she falls back right up against the back of my chair. I feel her trembling there and when I look up I see her the perspiration falling off of her chin. Don't get up says Dee. Since I am stout, it takes something of a push. She can see me trying to move a second or two before I make it. She turns, showing white heels through her sandals, and goes back to the car. Out she peeks next with the Polaroid. She stoops down quickly and snaps off picture after picture of me sitting there in front of the house with Maggie cowering behind me. She never takes a shot without making sure the house is included. When a cow comes nibbling around the edge of the yard, she snaps it and me and Maggie and the house. Then she puts the Polaroid in the back seat of the car and comes up and kisses me on the forehead. Meanwhile, Asalaamu Alaikum is going through motions and with Maggie's hand. Maggie's hand is as limp as a fish and probably as cold, despite the sweat, and she keeps trying to pull it back. It looks like Asalaamu Alaikum wants to shake hands but wants to do it fancy. Or maybe he don't know how people shake hands. Anyhow, he soon gives up on Maggie. Well, I say, D. No mama, she says, not D. Wanjero, Liwanika, Kimanjo. What happened to D? I wanted to know. She's dead, Wanjato said. I couldn't bear it any longer, being named after the people who oppress me. You know as well as me, you know as well as me, you was named after your Aunt Dicey. I said, Dicey is my sister. She named Dee. We called her Big D after Dee was born. But who was she named after, asked Wanjato. I guess after Grandma D, I said. And who was she named after, asked Wanjero. Her mother, I said, and saw Wanjero was getting tired. That's about as far back as I can trace it, I said. Though in fact, I probably could have carried it back beyond the Civil War through the branches. Well, said Assalamu alaikum, there you are. Mm, I heard Maggie say. There I was not, I said, before, before Dicey cropped up in our family 
So why should I try to trace it back that far? He stood there grinning, looking down on me like somebody inspecting a Model A car. Every once in a while, he and Juanjero sent eye signals over my head. How do you pronounce this name, I asked. You don't have to call me by it if you don't want to, said Juanjero. Why shouldn't I, I asked. If that's what you want us to call you, we'll call you. I know it might sound awkward at first, said Juanjero. I don't get used to it, I said. Ream it out again. Well, soon we got the name out of the way. Asalaamu Alaikum had a name twice as long and three times as hard. After I tripped over it two or three times, he told me to just call him Hakeem a barber. I once asked him if he was a barber, but I didn't really think he was, so I didn't ask. You must belong to those beef cattle people down the road, I said. They said Asalaamu Alaikum when they met you too. But they didn't shake hands. Always too busy feeding the cattle, fixing the fences, putting up salt lick shelters, throwing down hay. When the white folks poisoned some of the herd, the men stayed up all night with rifles in their hands. I walked in a mile and a half just to see the sight. Hakeem a barber said, I accept some of their doctrines, but farming and raising cattle is not my style. They didn't tell me and I didn't ask whether Juanjero D had really gone and married him. We sat down to eat and right away he said he didn't eat collars and pork was unclean. Juanjero went through though went on through the chili and the cornbread, the greens and everything else. She talked a blue streak over the sweet potatoes. Everything delighted her. Even the fact that we still used the benches her daddy made for the table when we couldn't afford to buy chairs. Oh, mama, she cried, then turned to Hakeem a barber. I never knew how lovely these benches are. You can feel the rump prints, she said, running her hands underneath her and along the bench. Then she gave a sigh and her hand closed over Grandma D's butter dish. That's it, she said. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over in the corner where the churn stood. The milk in its clabber by now. She looked at the churn and looked at it. This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy wiggle it out of a tree y'all used to have? Yes, I said. Uh-huh, she said happily. And I want the dasher too. Uncle Buddy whittled that too, she asked the barber. D looked up at me. Undie's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie, so low you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. Maggie's brain is like an elephant's, Juanjero said laughing. I can use the churn stop as a centerpiece for the a clove table, she said, sliding a plate over the churn, and I'll think of something artistic to do with the dasher. When she finished wrapping the dasher, the handle stuck out. I took it for a moment in my hands. You didn't have to look close to see where hands pushing the dasher up and down to make butter had left a kind of sink in the wood. In fact, there were a lot of small sinks. You could see where thumbs and fingers had sunk into the wood. It was beautiful light yellow wood from a tree that grew in the yard where Big D and Stash had lived. After dinner, D went to the trunk at the foot of my bed and started rifling through it. Maggie hung back in the kitchen with the, over the dishpan. Out came Juanjetto with two quilts. They had been pieced by Grandma D and then Big D and me had hung them on the quilt frames on the front porch and quilted up them. One was in the Lone Star pattern. The other was Walk Around the Mountain. In both of them, there were scraps of gr dresses Grandma D had worn 50 and more years ago, bits and pieces of Grandpa Gerald's paisley shirts, and one teeny faded blue piece about the size of a penny matchbox that was from Great Grandpa Ezra's uniform that he wore in the Civil War. Mama, one Jetta said, sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen, and a minute later, the kitchen door slammed. Why don't you take one or two of the others, I asked. These old things were just done by me and Big D for some, for, from some tops your grandma pieced together before she died. No, said Juanjero. I don't want those. 
Those are stitched around the borders by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. That's not the point, said Juanjero. These are all pieces of dresses Grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand. Imagine, she held the quilt securely in her arms, stroking them. Some of the pieces, like those lavender ones, come from old clothes her mother handed down to her, I said, moving up to touch the quilts. Dee moved back just enough so I couldn't reach the quilts. They already belonged to her. Imagine, she breathed to Glenn, clutching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promise to give them to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She probably be back en worse enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them long enough with nobody using them. I hope she will. I didn't want to bring up how I had offered Dee a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me that they were old-fashioned and out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now, furiously, for she had a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed, and in five years they'd be in rags. Less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. Dee looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point in this qu is these quilts. These quilts. Well, I said stumped. What would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if it was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie, by now, was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound of her feet as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama. She said, like somebody used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with ch checkerberry snuff and gave her face a kind of dopey, hand dog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. I did something I'd never done before. Hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wangetto's hand, and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with an open mouth. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee. But she turned without a word and went out to Hakeem a barber. You just don't understand, she said as Maggie and I came out to the car. What don't I understand, I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said. And then she turned to Maggie, kissed her, and said, You ought to try to make something of yourself too, Maggie. It's really a new day for us. But from the way you and Mama still live, you never know it. She put on some sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and chin. Maggie smiled, maybe at the sunglasses, but a real smile, not scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff. And then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go in the house and go to bed. So that's Alice Walker's Everyday Use. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed that fun little short story. If you want more short stories, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. It is the best. And I thank you guys for hanging out with me today. And I'll see you next time. Oh my God. Oh my God. Before we go. Remember to check out my website. Uh, I have another one. It's called www.litforbooks.com. Random release. It's going to host a ton of my papers. As well as literary tutorials. And course my bookshop. So make sure you go check out litforbooks.com today. And let me know what you think. Peace.